Uh, hey everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so in this talk, I'll be talking to you about how we can learn representations that can transfer across different languages. Um, and there are three key things that I would like you to take away from this talk. Um, the first one being uh, the importance of doing NLP, not just in English and languages with a lot of data, um, but caring about um, the other languages in the world. Um, the second is just a general awareness of the state of the art in this area. Um, and the third one being an appreci appreciation for what are, in my opinion, some key modeling challenges and potential solutions to those. Um, so starting with the first, the first part here, um, the key issue at the heart of this talk is the problem of language diversity in natural language processing research. What I mean by that is the discrepancy between the large number of languages spoken around the world and the comparatively small number of languages which are studied in traditional natural language processing research, which pre predominantly focuses on English and a small number of other languages with abundant, unlabeled and la uh, labeled data. Um, by focusing only on such a small number of languages, there are two big practical implications that that has. Um, the first one being that as a research community, we are systematically excluding the more than 3 billion speakers of languages with fewer resources um, available online. Um, in practice, uh, this can be seen and experienced by those uh, speakers of those languages um, in many aspects of day-to-day -day life. And just to give one out of a plethora of possible examples, if in a post-COVID era where you can actually um, go out for places to uh, to eat, uh, if you're in a big city such as New York and you want to uh, look for a place to go for dinner, you can make a query in a popular maps application um, looking for restaurants and you're presented with a number of different options. Um, you can make a similar query in another language with a lot of data, like Spanish, and you're presented with a different but similar set of options as well. Um, however, now if you make an identical query in a language with much fewer data, such as Basque, you're provided with no options at all. And given that this is an issue for a European language, Basque, with data that is as commonplace as data about restaurants, you can imagine how big of a problem that is in practice for most of the world's languages. Um, and when it comes to data, that is much more critical, like data about healthcare or clinical information. Um, and the second big aspect is that by focusing on developing methods that primarily work well for English, we're really overfitting the way we design our models and the inductive biases that we incorporate into our uh, models on the linguistic properties of English. Um, so while we've seen tremendous amount of success recently um, on a large number of different benchmarks in, in, in English and a couple of other languages, um, it's really not at all clear if these successes translate uh, that well to the other languages of the world. Um, so with that, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, more what typical and the best models in this area uh, currently look like. Um, so these days, one cannot go about discussing the state of the art in NLP without talking about the BERT um, model architecture and transfer learning, in particular, the pre-training fine-tuning paradigm. So just to get us all on the same page here, um, the BERT model um, takes as input um, a subword vocabulary in a language, typically English, um, feeds that then uh, associates with each subword a token embedding, a position embedding, and segment embedding, and then uh, each of those embeddings is then fed into a stack of transformer layers, where each transformer layer consists of uh, self-attention together with a couple of other transformations. Um, this BERT model is generally pre-trained with what is known as mask language modeling, um, where a random fraction of words in the input is masked out, and the word then is trained to predict the mask words at the output. Um, these models like BERT have, have been shown to learn uh, general purpose uh, representations of language, um, which are useful for many different downstream tasks of natural language processing. Um, so these models can typically be applied to tasks of interest, um, such as natural language inference here, where the model is trained to predict the relationship between a premise and a hypothesis, simply by fine tuning them on labeled data of the task. And most um, current state of the art approaches for English um, rely on kind of this similar um, uh, paradigm. Um, now, in multilingual modeling and cross-lingual NLP, the most successful models are themselves analogs of these um, successful monolingual transfer learning methods. Um, with a popular um, or a standard baseline being multilingual words. 
um, multilingual BERT um, can be seen as just a, a multilingual version of our monolingual English BERT um, with a couple of small differences. Uh, the first one being that because this model now is not only trained in one language, uh, English, but trained on data in many different languages, um, the vocabulary of the model now not only consists of subwords in English, but subwords in many different languages, such as uh, Spanish here. Um, in addition, now the model is trained, um, again, using mass language modeling, and uh, it's typically trained on data in many different languages. So the data and the batches that the model sees during training um, can be English, uh, like we can see here, um, but uh, as well as data in other languages, such as Spanish here. Um, then the way these models are typically used in practice is um, by fine-tuning them on a specific task, similar to what we've seen in the monolingual setting. Um, and in those cases, because we have the multilingual models, we typically fine tune them on uh, data of a task in a high resource language where there's abundant uh, label data available. Um, and then um, the kind of remarkable thing about these models is that um, even though they're only pre-trained on unlabeled data in, in different languages, they learn surprisingly robust cross-lingual representations. Um, so remarkably and interestingly, these models can be applied to different languages simply by performing zero-shot transfer to them. Um, what I mean by zero-shot transfer here is that these models can be applied to the same task um, without having ever, uh, without um, ever having seen label data um, of that task in a particular language and can still be expected to achieve reasonable performance in most cross-single tasks this way. Um, now, most recent state-of-the-art methods follow this general um, paradigm and methodology um, for multilingual pre-training. Um, in fact, most of them are really variants of this uh, multilingual BERS pre-trained multilingual transformer architecture, um, with most of them being quite a bit larger than the typical bird based architecture that you might be um, used to using. Um, in fact, most of them have a vocabulary of around 250,000 subwords in uh, many different languages, uh, around 550 million uh, parameters, um, and are typically trained on a combination of Wikipedia and web text data in around 100 different languages. Um, now to give you a glimpse into um, what recent progress on uh, tasks in crossing and P looks like, um, you can see here a, a chart plotting the performance from multilingual bird on the on the left, um, all the way to the most recent state of the art me methods on the extreme benchmark, which consists of nine tasks in 40 languages, which can be seen as a multi multilingual counterpart to the glue and super glue benchmarks for measuring mono monolingual transfer learning uh, performance. And to zero in here in on the um, kind of most uh, most important values, uh, we can see here that if we only look at the average performance on this benchmark, um, that we've seen steady and continuous amount of progress from multilingual bird all the way to more recent methods. Um, however, recently this progress has um, arguably slowed down a bit compared to the uh, earlier jumps in performance, um, and there still remains a large gap. Uh, compared to the human level performance in terms of transferring to many different languages. And now how to perhaps uh, recover or try to bridge this gap, which has been already achieved in monolingual transfer learning. I'm going to talk about um, a couple of challenges um, that I see in this area, the remaining amount of time that I have. Um, and here in particular, I want to talk about um, two modeling challenges um, that can be seen as relating to different parts of this pre-trained transfer transformer architecture, um, with the first one relating to the overall um, capacity and number of parameters of the model, um, and the second challenge relating to the way we, we represent the input, in particular, how we view the text as a sequence of subwords in different languages. Um, now, starting with the first uh, challenge here, um, the um, heart uh, of this issue um, really relates to what is known as the curse of multilinguality, um, which is simply the trade-off between a model's average performance on a number of different languages and the number of languages it has been pre-trained on. Um, to make that a bit more concrete, you can see here a graph on a standard cross-single task um, where we have a model with a fixed capacity um, 
uh, and we increase the number of languages uh, to the right, um, the model has been pre-trained on. And as you can easily see here, the more languages a model uh, has been pre-trained on, um, the less on average is its performance on each of those languages. Um, that makes sense um, intuitively, because as um, we keep the capacity of the model fixed, the more languages we pre-train the model on, um, the more languages compete for the model's uh, limited capacity. So, they each, um, for, so for each individual language, the model has fewer capacity and fewer parameters to model each of those languages appropriately. Um, now, as I mentioned before, state-of-the-art methods um, try to strike a balance by covering about 100 of these languages in their pre-trained data. Um, so by doing this, uh, these models can still be used as reasonable baselines for um, a large number of different languages, um, but uh, themselves cannot really excel in any of those languages themselves. Um, so the main question from a research perspective here is really how we can improve performance of these models on those languages we particularly care about, whether they were already encountered by the model during its pre-training or whether they were completely um, unseen by the model and um, are in fact languages with much fewer data that we um, would still uh, like to do well on. Um, and the key um, methodol methodology um, that I want to highlight here and possibly advocate for is known as adapters, which are just um, small bottleneck layers that are inserted between uh, pre-trained model weights. Um, so you can see them here in context of a standard transformer la layer, which consists of a, a multi-head attention layer uh, coupled with a feedforward network that is itself sandwiched between two layer normalizations. Um, now, for inserting the adapter layer, um, you can place it at different positions, but it's typically placed just um, before the final layer normalization. Um, and as I mentioned, this adapter layer is very simple in its architecture. It simply consists of one um, feedforward down projection, one feedforward up projection, coupled with a residual connection towards the input. Um, and the cool thing now, or just to think about these um, layers conceptually, is that they're treated as um, separate from the remaining parameters of the model. Um, and the way these layers are trained is that we keep all parameters of the underlying model fixed and then just learn these adapter layers for a particular task of interest. Um, and by doing this, we can basically rely on one single copy of our underlying model. And we only need to learn a small number of um, task or language specific parameters for each individual setting that we care about. Um, so in this setting, for doing multilingual NLP with using adapters. Um, the way to think about it is that these adapters essentially learn um, transformations that make this underlying fixed pre-trained model more suitable um, to your particular task or language of interest. Um, and in this context, we can learn um, language-specific adapter layers by um, essentially doing the same pre-training that we already did for pre-training our entire model from scratch, um, but now just focused on fine-tuning or training these um, language-specific adapter parameters. So we can learn the um, adapters for different languages, such as English and Kedra here, simply by doing mass language modeling on data in each of those different language languages. Um, and because we keep the underlying model fixed, these parameters are essentially interchangeable. So we can have a model um, with an English adapter that is suited for English, and we can make the same model more suited to Kedra by simply replacing the English adapter with its Kedra counterpart. Um, now I don't have more uh, more time to go into more detail here, um, but uh, we have proposed a framework that builds on this idea of using adapters for um, zero-shot cross-lingual transfer and combines them with task adapters that, in addition, capture something about the underlying task um, in order to enable a parameter-efficient way to adapt to different languages and tasks at the same time. Um, now, the, the second modeling challenge um, that I want to highlight here regards the input representation um, of the model. Um, as I mentioned before, um, monolingual models like BERT and multilingual models um, these days uh, take support, support representations as input. And these support um, uh, embeddings are based on uh, standard um, segmentation algorithms like byte pair encoding OBB which split words in different subwords typically based on frequency. And the effect that has in practice is that 
for languages, we have a lot of data and where consequently many words are uh, seen a lot of times in your data. Um, those particular words um, will be split and associated with very few subwords uh, in comparison. So, for instance, for uh, the English word excitement, because that occurs a lot in the train data, um, that word is associated in the vocabulary of the um, recent state of the art model with a single subword. Um, however, in contrast, um, the translations of excitement in other languages, such as German and Greek, because these um, occur much less frequently in the pre-trained data, are split into three or four subwords, respectively. Um, and, in, and this mismatch in terms of the segmentation across different languages um, makes it very difficult for the model to really to properly transfer this token level information across different languages. Because you can imagine that for languages um, among these hundred languages the model has been treated on with much fewer data, for some of them, um, some subwords might consist of even single or uh, sets of uh, n-gram characters. Um, so it's very hard for the model to actually learn reliable um, reliable embeddings for these. Um, to ameliorate this, one set of methods that we can borrow, or one area that has been very actively researched in machine translation is um, this area of subword segmentation. And as I mentioned, um, on the one hand, we have these deterministic subword segmentation algorithms like BPE, which are kind of standard in current um, methods like BERT. Um, on the other hand, we also have recently in mainly used machine translation, um, probabilistic segmentation methods like BV dropout, um, which can essentially view as um, dropping out or randomly doing training, sampling different um, possible segmentations um, to make the model more robust to such segmentation errors in different languages. Um, so consequently, one way we can make the model more robust through these erroneous segmentations of the languages is to use support regularization, uh, simply doing fine tuning of these multilingual pre-trained language models. Um, and one particular insight or one important point here is that um, because these, uh, the pre-training of these large models is very expensive, we don't really um, want to do this um, segmentation uh, doing pre-training, but just doing fine tuning. Um, however, because these models are typically pre-trained with probabilistic segmentation, um, we also don't want to have a mismatch between the segmentation that we used in pre-training and the probabilistic segmentation we might want to utilize during fine-tuning. Um, so to combat that, um, we, we propose to use both um, segmentations uh, during fine-tuning. So given an input, we can both um, compute a cross-entry objective over um, the segmented version of the input computed with the probabilistic segmentation as well as um, with the version over the probabilistic segmentation, um, combining that into a joint cross-entropy uh, loss. Um, and the other thing that we found to be very helpful here is in addition, um, taking some inspiration from approaches in similar supervised learning to enforce uh, consistency between the predictions, both over the deterministic and the probabilistic segmentation input. In particular, we can use some distance measure, such as KL divergence, to enforce that no matter the uh, segmentation, the model still outputs uh, the same prediction. And we found this in particular to be very crucial to make the model um, more robust to different segmentation errors and possible uh, segmentations in different languages. Um, and we can combine both of those together into final loss. Um, so with that, I hope I was able to um, give you some ideas about the importance of doing NLP across languages, um, what the state of the art in this area and recent progress actually looks like, um, and some important challenges and areas for improvement in the state of the art models. Um, thanks.